Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for coming here to listen to us. And I believe the most important technology we have is the human resource. The people we have, and we're going to talk about young professionals. I have a passion for young people. I've done youth ministry in church for many years. And so I just love talking about young people. And when this topic came up, I was very glad to accept it. And my previous speaker, many of the other speakers have made my job easy. When we talk about Africa, we have a situation. There is a situation. The situation offers both an opportunity and a risk. And I brought a little prop here just to make sure I satisfy local content. It's a one CD coin. <laughs> it's a coin, but it has two sides. The issue we are dealing with has two sides. It has an opportunity side and a risk side, but it's the same coin. In Africa, we are fast generating our internal population. And many of them are youth. And so that is an opportunity, but it's also a risk. Because youth unemployment is very high. If you go to all countries in Africa which have had big social problems like Boko Haram, and you know, uh, you have terror organizations, you have a um, war, civil war, and you've had child soldiers, which children first go into these places? Unemployed youth. So it's a big opportunity, but it's also a big risk. Big opportunity, we are talking about the expansion of Africa's economies and uh, interesting and exciting things going on. But if we do not deal with our youth and our young professionals, we are actually creating a time bomb. So it's very important that we discuss this topic of developing young professionals. Some of them work, but they work for uncles, aunties, and we just give them some stipend. We, we barely pay them well. So they are working, but they are underemployed. And they form part of what we are talking about. And sometimes, even as formal companies, some of us, advertently or inadvertently, abuse the system and use young professionals um, you know, to create good profit, but underemploying their skills. So this applies to each and every one of us here. Young people will inherit many of the problems that have been created in the past. Somebody mentioned Obuasi has been mining for over 100 years. A lot of legacy problems have been created. As we mine today, legal or illegal, small scale or large scale, we are still creating many problems for the environment. Many of us will not be around to deal with the full implications when they hit our community. Some have already hit, some are yet to hit. Who will be dealing with these? The young professionals, some of them in this room, some yet to appear in this room. They will be dealing with a lot of the problems that we are working with today. They are the future of our nation and our workforce. We keep saying that. But if we say they are our future, what are we doing to make sure we are adequately preparing this future so that when we hand over the reins, they can do the excellent job that some of us have already done, and in fact that they will do an even better job. So it's very important that in all that talk about the future of Africa and the future of Ghana, we keep in mind our young professionals. If we leave them out of the equation, it's just stuck. We are heading for a disaster. Ultimately, we are coming up with all sorts of policies. In 20 years, we want this. And there are all kinds of policies being promulgated by government, by UN, by all sorts of organizations. The people who will be implementing a lot of these policies are young professionals. Many of us will not even be active in the workforce to implement some of the policies that we are coming up with. So all we do, we must make sure we have our young professionals in mind. If we leave them out, we are leaving a gaping hole that will not bode well for our nation. It's important that as we talk and we develop policies, we bring them in. If they do not understand why we are discussing some of the things we discussed, you know, Prof told us about some of the small scale mining and the tricks and techniques to help them so they do things efficiently and safely and all that stuff. We need our young professionals to be part of the development of all these ideas because most of what they are, I mean, to fully implement this, we need a new generation to take it up. And Prof rightly mentioned that some of the students that they are training will take up some of these things and actually take it to the communities and implement them. It's part of that whole 
developing our young professionals for a sustainable mining industry. If we want our mining industry to continue and to be a benefit to our country, we cannot leave out our young professionals. Leaving them out will be a huge mistake. They are hungry. How many of us, I'm sure many of us in this room who are in management positions, or not even in management positions, get CVs all the time. And young people call us and they bug us. They will call us again and again. They are hungry for jobs. They are hungry to be part of the game. Sometimes, and I'll admit, when we are very busy and you have reports to submit and clients calling you, you are late and all that stuff, and a young man or woman calls you asking for a job or an opportunity, you see them as a nuisance. I'll admit, I've been guilty at times. But the issue is they are not a nuisance. They are just hungry for opportunity, to be able to contribute, to be able to earn money, to be able to do the things that they see us do. So we have to understand that they are not a nuisance, they are a resource for us. They are an opportunity for us to advance the work we are doing in the mining industry. And so we have to develop them, we have to attract them. Actually, instead of rejecting them, we must have the mindset of being able to attract them, groom them, equip them with the right skills, the right approaches, so that they can contribute to the success of our industry. If we don't do that, our industry will struggle in the future. And I remember one gentleman, and I did love his contribution so much, said years ago the number of attachments they did to be able to contribute to the industry. We don't have that as much anymore. But we need to bring in a lot more of that. There are a lot more students. I remember I did my national service in NEMA. I was working for NEMA 441 Welfare Association. And part of that, that was when there was a lot of discussion about switching from the old system to the current system of uh, the BEC and all that stuff. And one of the things that drove that movement was the fact that we would train a lot of children, but by the time they do common entrance, many fall out because they do not pass. By the time you get to O level, we've lost a, an even bigger percentage. By the time you got to the universities, we had three or four universities that could take maybe in total 20,000 students at best in Ghana. We saw that as a big problem. Government pushed for it. We reformed the educational system so that we do not lose this resource. Now we have so many private universities. I don't even remember the number, but it's well, I'm sure it's well over 70. So we have done a good job of beginning to train our resource, but we still have a problem in terms of opportunities for the young professionals to contribute to the growth of our country. And we need to address that. Now, if we are going to address it, we must understand what these young professionals want. So that, because you cannot address a problem if you do not understand it fully, you do not get the full picture, we could come up with a solution that does not work. So one of the things is, let us understand, what do these young professionals want? What is driving them? What is motivating them? One of the things is, they seek mentorship. That is one of the reasons why they call us a lot, they want our cards, they want to speak to us. Because they realize there is a need to get more knowledge, more opportunity from us. And you know, a lot of times we think they are too known, uh, and I'll get to that. Some of these young professionals, they think they know too much. But many of them actually don't think they know too much, they want to know more from us. And we have built a lot of institutional knowledge. We have so many gray hairs sitting in this room who have worked in the industry, seen the problems, seen the threats, and we need to pass this knowledge down to the young professionals so that they can take up the mantle and develop even more innovative and creative solutions for the problems we are facing today. They want us to share our wisdom not through lecturing, but through storytelling. And it's very important. I had a young man who came by my office two weeks ago. He had submitted a CV to our company looking for an opportunity. I knew I did not have a position for him. But he had called so many times and the administrator came and told me, this young man keeps calling. What do we do? And I was so busy, but I said, you know what, okay, let him come, we'll have a chat. So he came and we sat down. The first thing I did was I took his CV. And I said, okay, Daniel, this is the CV you submitted. Did you have somebody read it over before you brought it? Not really, he did his best. So I said, okay, this is what I'm going to do for you. I do not, I was upfront, I do not have an opportunity right now for you. I'll be very clear. I wish I had a job for you, but I do not have. 
but there is something I am going to try and invest in you. Hopefully it helps you. Maybe you can approach somebody else who has the opportunity. And if my words help you do that, at least I have contributed to your life. So we went through the CV, edited it, lots of mistakes, different things there. I identified a few things that were actually a strength. He said he had developed certain techniques. I asked him, Daniel, did you really develop the technique? Because if you did, then it's a magnificent thing. If you did not, then you are a froster. <laughs> and then he said, no, he actually did. So he explained and I said, good, so we have to highlight this in the, on your CV. Because if you go to a potential emplo employer, this is something you can be proud of and let them see what you can do in the field in which you are. So we went through that. I told him to go to a chamber of mines because he wanted to work in mines, hang around uh, events like this, network, build network of people. That could help him achieve his goals. He sent me a fantastic email after that saying it has changed his perspectives, it has helped his life. I'm only saying that sometimes we may not have the actual employment opportunity, but we do have a lot of knowledge and skill that we can impart to our young professionals to make a difference in their lives. They are comfortable when they can relate to things. So everything is why. In my days, that tells you something, you just do it. This morning, my son, whom we have been training to use the bathroom well, still makes mistakes, you know boys. Every woman knows what I'm talking about. He goes and he makes a mess. My wife starts yelling at him. He comes to me and says, why is mommy yelling? <laughs> Dad. And then he says, but why? And so I showed him why and the mess he's created and the why is mom or somebody can go and just sit on the seat and, you know, end up in a mess. Then he says, okay. In my days, if dad said, why did you do that? I don't ask him why. If I ask why, I wouldn't be alive today to <laughs> talk to you. But today, it's a different world. Our children ask why. The young professionals ask why. We must understand that when they come to us with a lot of questions, it is their quest for knowledge and we have to give them the answers. They are not a nuisance. They need time to process the information. Part of it is because of WhatsApp and social media. It takes a lot of, they, it's overload of information. They need to process all and sift out the nuggets of gold like prof shoulders. And so it takes them time. I have realized in working with young professionals, I don't know, maybe I was not as fast. I only think I was faster when I was younger. But I do realize that they do require time to process some of the information. Because there's way more information today than you and I had when we were schooling then. Once they have that, they are very focused. We must remember that. They are an asset. They are a resource. They are not a nuisance. And they need bosses who have their back, not be on their back. So I tell you, even at home, we have that problem. Um, sometimes as parents, we are overexcited and we drive our kids and they just say, Dad, you are... You are you are annoying or you are yelling at me or you are pushing me. I don't like that. And I say, oh, Jesus, if I had ever told that to my father, I'm telling you. But this is the world in which they live. They want us to support them more, to help them advance their careers. And we must have that as part of the way we operate. If we are to help our young professionals develop in a way that helps Ghana, they need to ask questions. They want to feel they are important. And so when we come to forums like this, when we go for meetings, I believe it's absolutely important for us to take some of our young professionals, to start exposing them to the way business is done, to the important drivers of what we do in mining. As we do that, we'll be helping our nation. If we only let our youth small or you small girls sit there and we go and we just do our own things, when are they going to acquire that skill set and that knowledge? So we have to involve them in that. And those are things they do. How do we engage them? The question, the dreaded question every time you can ask the mining companies, I mean, you guys know that way more than I do, if you have meetings with communities, it's all about employment. They only want to consider how are we going to employ them. And it's impossible for us to employ every person who comes to us. That is not possible. But as much as possible, and uh, I know I heard a previous, I think the Asanko GM tell us there are policies to hire locals and give them preference, we must make it a part of what we all do, be it consulting or mining companies. Let us give them as many chances as we can. Give them internships. I've heard, um, again, the mining companies talk about internships. We have not formalized it too well, I must admit. 
but going forward is something we want to do, have a more formal process to bring in interns. And sometimes what has happened in my industry, we are consulting. Golda is a consulting company. We do geotech, environmental, you know, usual mining, petroleum stuff. But what I have decided to do and which I have done and as a company we are promoting is we give as many young people opportunities as we can. There are only so many we can take. But give them opportunities. Sometimes I know I'm training them for my um, how do you call it, competition. It's the obvious. But I would still do that for the love of this nation and for the benefit of our young professionals. If I don't have opportunity and KP or somebody else has the opportunity, why not? And we have to have that mindset so that we can help um, develop our young people. And like I said, they want mentoring, they want advice, they want us to pour our lives into them. So we have to make time and room to do that for them. They are very eager to listen and absorb. I find that. And like I said, they will really challenge you. They will ask you a lot of questions. And as they ask questions, they develop. So we entrust them with that. And they make mistakes. Let me add that. They make mistakes. But that is why they want to associate with us. So that we can point them out. We can point out to them what the right things are. So they can do the right things. And we need to give them opportunity to express their goals, their desires, what they want to be in the future, their ambitions. It's very important. If we do not know their ambitions, how can we help them reach where they want to be? And what we also have to understand is the world is changing. When I was growing up, my son today has already started programming Java, JavaScript. He's only 13. He does that on his own. When I was growing up, there was nothing like Java, basic. I mean, what was programming? It was foreign to our education because that a whole industry did not exist. There are so many industries or ways we are um, employing things in mining that did not exist 20 years ago, 30 years ago. And the world is still changing. We heard one of the speakers talk about new methods of mining and having underground mills. Things are changing, robotics. Things are changing. As I speak to you today, there are children in robotic camps for the summer learning how to program robots. Ghana does well in some of these competitions. These are ways, as an industry, we can contribute to improve the future of the industry in Ghana. Another thing that also saddens me sometimes, but excites me because it's an opportunity, and it was mentioned earlier, is the use of experts in a mining industry. I cannot see a sustainable industry if we are not grooming young professionals to take over a lot of these positions. If we will continue the model of just bringing in experts to come and do a lot of key jobs, I'm sorry we are failing. We must have a targeted plan to make sure that in educating our young people, in sponsoring them, in supporting them, they are being developed to take over a lot of these positions. So that the day will come where 99% of the personnel on our mine sites will be well educated, very capable, well established Ghanaian professionals. That will help our um, industry be sustainable. It's just to say Africa rising. We as Africa, there's a book called Africa Rising. It's one of my favorite books. Yes, you can talk about the challenges of Africa. We do have, but we have a lot of opportunities. As we speak, if you are in consulting, you know that many of the consultants still target Africa, the companies, not just Golden. Why? Because this is where the future of mining really lies. And we cannot take full advantage of it if we do not develop our young professionals to take over this industry. Thank you very much. It was a nice point to raise here that uh, we should train we students so that we don't have to go in for experts to come and do more specific jobs. But here's the case, we sometimes realize our own Ghanaians, when they have ex some of these skills and leave the country, and they go out and naturalize as different country citizens, and come back here and get paid as experts. And those are the normal, like the Ghanaians here who have never traveled, would also like that because when you come back as an expert, 
like your remuneration, like what you get paid is is higher. So how are we also addressing that issue? Thank you. Good morning. My name is Damien from YM United Chapter. Uh, during your presentation, you made mention that young people will inherit today's problems. And based on that saying, I'm going to look at it from a different angle. As of now, we know global global warming is a very critical thing. And I'm saying I'm, I'm bringing this up because I'm pursuing renewable energy engineering. So I want to know, since the mining companies, it's a general question though, not specifically to you. Since the mining industries are also engaged in practices that help, uh, that also uh, cause the rise in carbon, carbon, carbon in the atmosphere. What are the mining companies doing uh, to actually uh, allow we, the renewable ener energy engineers, be part of the industry? Yes, now on a huge chapter. Um, I wanted to contribute. As students, if we are being taught what to use the information we get for, for instance, if um, a student geologist is asked to go for samples, and we don't know what the sample is used for, if maybe um, at our lecturers tell us what we use the sample for, we'll be able to have more idea on like what to do. And we'll be able to we'll be able to process the information better instead of they just telling us go and do this, go and do that. They should tell us why we are doing this so that it will reduce, reduce the questions we ask them. If I should tell us some stats about what I say, apparently the reason why I'm saying so. If you look at our operations, we have wide operators, we have shaft masters. I mean, we have 12 of them now, and all of them are on pension. There's no young guy taking over from them. Second, when it comes to another specialized area, race boring. That's where we'll be going in the future. No young guy over there. Brain drain and um, experts, that was the first question we heard. It is a topic that is very personal to me. And because I schooled in Ghana, I went uh, on an Eastern European scholarship, then I went to Canada to do graduate studies, and I went married. You know, life happens, as Canadians say. You marry, you have children. So I ended up living in Canada way longer than I originally planned. But my dream was always to return to Ghana, and that's what I did in 2011. And when I came, I specifically... Sometimes I look back, back at that decision, and I think um, it was a bit idiotic when I think of the financial consequences, but it's something I'm still proud of. I refuse to come back as an expert. That was just me. It's not to criticize anybody or I just said that was the decision I made to come back not as an expert but as a local. Now, the financial part, um, I must say, uh, my wife reminds me about that all the time. <laughs> but nevertheless, it does happen. Whatever it is, I believe that, and that is part of why I love these forums because we share these ideas. A lot of what drove me to do engineering was one gentleman called Dr. Kofisa. I'm sure some of us know him. Appropriate technology those days. He spoke a lot about it. He went around lecturing. That is why I ended up in engineering. Because I heard people who inspired me. And this is what I hope that we also inspire. And that is part of why it was never my dream to go outside and stay forever. It was always go get educated, get a skill set, come back. And that is what has happened. And I'm, my hope is that as we have these discussions, more of you learn this and you encourage your friends who have gone and we encourage each other to come back. There are people, when I told them I was going back to Ghana, and this is not a joke, some said, are you having problems with your wife when you're running away? <laughs> no, there were all sorts of questions. They so said, what is wrong with you? But I have told them this has been one of the best decisions I ever made, coming back to Ghana. Professionally, I've been very fulfilled. I'm actually doing more here than I would have had in Canada because I was working, but we had so many principals and people ahead of me. I don't know when I would have reached their level. I came here, I have. So for me, but challenges are what offers the opportunities to grow. So it's not a negative. And my hope that as we have these discussions, we're able to encourage each other more and we take up the mantle of coming back and contributing to the development of our country. Brain brain is a serious problem, 
But I can also tell you that more and more I see people coming back. I'm not alone in this at all. I have a colleague who is exactly like what I'm talking about. She did a PhD in Canada, work, she's back, she works in Golda with us. And I see more and more of that happening. And it's a good thing. I pray that it turns into a fly. But that is something that, it, it's a good question. How do we address it? I think we must continue to drive this message. I say part of why I came back, I told you, was because I'm a child of the revolution. And what I mean by that is when the first coup came in 1979, I just finished common entrance, just around that time. So we really went through the whole this thing, in 81 and all that stuff. And you know, um, the patriotic songs on um, the radio all the time. I'm serious. Those are the things, as much as you might find it odd, but it drove me. For me, it was important, and that is part of why I am here. And I believe that we must do that. So what uh, Night Peace Old is doing as part of that program, I was taking notes. These are some things we we'll also try, but again, encourage our own people to be passionate about Ghana. That's the only way we're going to develop Ghana. If we all run away, and I, every time I go on the plane, those, I mean, Dr. Benedu knows, the flight is full of, you know, experts or foreigners who are coming to Ghana to make money. And I'm sitting in Canada and saying, Ghana is a dangerous place there, which is, a, you know, that's a problem. <laughs> I think we should come back and contribute. Yeah. We spoke about global warming, um, renewable energy. That I throw to the mining industry. The veterans, you've heard a young man. Um, please, uh, so when you're finished, you have the license, you talk to all the GMs and all the senior staff here and find out what they are doing about renewable energy and how you, you can employ your skill set in that area. I think that's important. Uh, and mining companies can also tell us what they are doing when the time presents itself. And then the lady had a question about sampling. That was a great question. They need to know the why, not just take sample and stuff. As for that, it goes to the professors. <laughs> so props, I, you know, they need to know the why. It's again what, you remember I told you, we need to know who they are in order to be able to help them. They have voiced out that uh, need. Again, very well said very eloquent and to the point. So as an industry, here is the challenge again thrown to us. It is our responsibility to go to the universities, go to the institutions, through um, our school programs, reach out to young people. They do not even know that these professions exist in the mining industry. I think there was a gentleman who said, that's, that's part of what is contributing to Galamse. When a young man's only dream is to do um, the small scale mining because that's all they have ever seen. They do not know that if they were, even without a university degree, they could acquire some skills and maybe they could operate the jumbo. They would rather go for that because Anglo will pay them better, they'll get a better pension. They do understand economics very well. Remember, Galamse is an economic problem. It is an economic situation. They know the gold price much better than I do, the daily fluctuation of the gold price. And so they are not. Uh, idiots. They really are many intelligent people who want to contribute to our nation. But it's for us to let them know these opportunities exist and so they can aspire. Remember we spoke about ambitions and aims. So I believe that as an industry, and maybe this is something we throw out to the chamber, please let us go out into our schools and educate them about these opportunities. Thank you very much.